following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. Gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Eric Knoll, NASDAQ OMX. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eric Knoll uh, from NASDAQ OMX, and uh, welcome to the 30th annual Options Industry Conference. This industry and this particular exchange update started uh, when we last hosted this conference in South Beach six years ago. And seeing the size of the audience, I'm glad to see people made it back from Bourbon Street. Um, the bars must be closed this afternoon or something. Uh, today you will hear some brief exchange and industry updates, allowing you to hear the latest in technology, exchange products, and their strategy going forward for the next year. Bob Greifeld, NASDAQ's chairman, is speaking tomorrow morning, followed by Zach Rosenberg of the St. Bernard's Project, the exchange leadership panel, and a host of other interesting presentations. We're trying something new at this year's conference. We've added a program, the Wealth Advisor Summit, which is going on in the conference room back there, which focuses on the use of options to help financial advisors maximize yield and minimize risk for their customers. We understood the risks with associating, uh, associated in creating and managing a new program at this conference, and we're happy to report that we've reached our attendance goals for it, and we look forward to the success of that program that started earlier this afternoon and continues through tomorrow. This program is taking place across the hall, as I mentioned, and we welcome you to engage with the attendees as you see them here at the conference. We hope you like the venue, the speakers, and the panelists over the next few days. Enjoy your time here in New Orleans. Take this opportunity to meet new friends and business associates, and most importantly, share ideas with one another. I'd now like to introduce Peter Clifford. He is the Deputy Secretary General of the World Federation of Exchanges. Peter joined the Federation in 2000 from Euronext Paris, now NYSE Euronext, where he was the head of international market development. His early experience in financial markets began with State Street Bank and Trust in Boston. He was also a swaps broker for an interdealer, intermarket dealer and held various positions with Dow Jones in London and Paris. He's a graduate of the University of Kent at Canterbury and the University of Paris. Peter was born in Boston and is also a citizen of the Republic of Ireland. He's truly an international person. He is married and has two daughters. Please join me in welcoming Peter Clifford. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back here uh, in New Orleans and really a great pleasure to be at the OIC conference and thank Barry and everyone at NASDAQ and OIC for inviting me uh, here. Last year was my first chance to come and speak about uh, the international options markets and derivatives, exchange-traded derivative markets. And so uh, I was on a panel last year with John Jamgard, and I think we had about a half an hour. And today I have about seven minutes, which is about twice as much as I had to speak last time at the panel. So what I wanted to do is just show you a few slides. I'm sorry I'm the guy with the slides, but just go through a couple of things about WFE because I think that explains it better. Um, than uh, anything else. The WFE is a, uh, a trade association. It's the one global uh, group for all of the operators of derivatives and stock exchanges. Uh, we have 52 members covering all the major exchanges around the world. And for them, we do research and we do statistics and we have various meetings. And so there are some slides up here somewhere. I'm going to try and point like that, but that's not going to work. So what I was going to show you is just, first of all, as part of the two things we do, some stats on options, and you know probably all of this, but putting it in a global context might be interesting. And second, a piece of research that's going to be coming out in a couple of days, and also I thought it might be interesting for an options crowd. On the stats side, um, basically every year we do a survey of all the markets around the world, and uh, this is just an excerpt from exchange-traded derivatives generally on the option side. So for 2011, we still had really good growth, 16.4%, which was 13 billion exchange-traded derivative options contracts traded. And Asia-PAC was really remarkable, growing at 22%, good growth in Asia, uh, sorry, in America's at 15%. And you can see broken out there the uh, Europe 
uh, Africa, Middle East zone, are growing less quickly at 5%. On the exchange-traded side, it's two stories in terms of volumes. That's basically equities, 93% of uh, the trading in options. And then on notional value, 72%. I don't know if you see these slides well from the back. 72% on the notional value is on interest rates. So it breaks down that way when you look at it by asset class. Um, generally, kind of two stories. We saw on the first slide the growth, uh, growth rates of, I think it was around 12% over a number of years on the options markets. And that continued uh, in 2011 uh, right across the board, but especially with uh, some of the newer products having higher growth rates. Um, but on the bottom of these slides, and you can get these slides off of our website, um, the start of 2012 is showing up to be slightly more challenging period, and I'm sure you're aware of that with uh, index options trading down 22%, and generally equity and interest rates down 13% for the first three months of this year. Um, this is a slide on ETFs, which I'll jump over, because it always feels good when you're in a crowd and somebody doesn't explain a whole slide, doesn't it? Going on to uh, general around uh, options trading around the world, um, here are some of the major uh, markets that are out there at the moment. Um, the Korea, Korean exchange, KOSPI 200 index, which is the most traded around the world, is going to be reweighted. So there's going to be a five times uh, change in the volume of that, which brings down, when you look at it that way, their total uh, size of the market to 27% of the global market. And I see India with all the currency options that they're trading now, 31%. Eurex, of course, the biggest in Europe, and SIBO, um, the largest in the, uh, in the U.S., uh, on the interest rate option side, uh, slower growth there, 2% uh, in 2011, and still uh, the trading on that side has not uh, surpassed on the interest rates, short-term and long-term combined, has not surpassed the level of 2007. Uh, and one final uh, point on our statistics side, and that's the significance of innovative products. Uh, this is futures and options combined, and it's probably impossible to read this from the back of the room, but uh, you have markets like uh, SIBO with the volatility index uh, represented here, Eurex with uh, uh, carbon emissions trading in a couple of um, dividend indexes in Tokyo and Hong Kong and, uh, and, else, and other places. Fairly recent uh, contracts, but showing really good growth and really getting traction around, around the world. So that's sort of the overall look at options uh, and the options market uh, as WFE sees that. And as I said, this is kind of stuff that we're doing every month, and you can find it on our website, and uh, would be happy to have you uh, use any of this uh, the second part of the work that we do is on research projects. And in 2010, we got together uh, with Tab Group to look at the OTC uh, markets and the migration of derivative contracts from OTC to clearinghouses and on exchange trading. Uh, that report that came out, as I said, around November 2010, uh, one of the highlights of that was uh, the amount of collateral that would need to be posted if this migration was to happen. And the sort of headline figure was around $2 trillion dollars. And this first graph is showing that that's actually coming down, as you'd probably expect. A lot of OTC vanilla uh, uh, contracts are being uh, cleared now already. And uh, the first kind of slice we had at this data, as again I'm saying it should be coming out in a couple of weeks' time, is seeing that the uh, amount is now down now to about $1.6 trillion dollars in terms of collateral there. Like the options market we saw, the exchange-traded options market, the OTC uh, Market had tremendous growth uh, for over uh, 10 years or so, and 19.5% uh, uh, annual growth rates. And as Tab looks at this, it sees that these uh, predictions for 2012 and 2013 would probably be getting uh, stagnating a little bit. Um, we're certainly in a transitional market, both on the OTC side. I'm not doing this, by the way. This is just all doing this by itself. This is automated trading. Um, and so, uh, and so, basically, we're in a very tra transitional period, as I, as I'm sure everyone realizes, uh, both on the OTC side at the moment, and uh, on the exchange traded side. Well, that was the interesting slides. That uh, and that just about wraps it up. There was one last uh, slide. Thank you. 
um, on the surveys that you'll be able to see, and this should be out in a couple of, of months. They surveyed dealers as to what they're seeing in terms of trends in the market, what they expect to see happening on a whole bunch of different asset classes, and generally this, uh, what we're looking to see, and this is probably not surprising to you, but one of the conclusions is that we should be seeing smaller transaction sizes and that the trading of OTC and exchange traded is going to become aligned, as you would expect, with the, uh, with the G20 uh, demands to have most of the stuff cleared and uh, exchange traded uh, coming into effect next year. So anyway, that was just a few of the uh, examples of research and the statistics that were done at WFE. And if you have questions, we're here for a couple of days, and we'd be happy to talk to you. And if you want to find that later on, please look on our website. And, uh, and I hope you have a great time in New Orleans. And, I, and thank you again for having me here. All right. Peter, thank you for that introspective look into how the WFE uh, is focusing their attention as we go forward. Uh, I found it pretty interesting, and I hope the audience now has a better understanding of the issues that the WFE is tackling and working through. Uh, at this time, I, we, I think we'd like to begin the exchange's uh, individual <coughs> presentations, and so I'd like to invite Joe Bracco, uh, head of U.S. Sales and the Vice President Bast. Thank you, Eric. If we can make these lights a little brighter, I can continue to work on my tan while I'm up here. Um, first, a high-level look at BATS globally. April capped off one of our best months on record. We had 11.5% match market share in our equities markets. BATS options was back over 3% market share. And just this past Monday, we completed a seamless transition of the CHI-X Europe platform onto the BATS te technology, giving us just about 25% of the overall pan-European equities volume. So BATS options. We look back over the last two years that we've run our U.S. options market and see that there are some things that we got right. MVVO Shutter, for instance, was the main catalyst behind last year's growth on BATS options that helped move the market share yield for us from just less than 1% to near 5% late last spring. And the more recent quoting incentive program, or QIP, designed to encourage members to consistently make aggressive markets across a broad range of series, deepening the overall breadth of the BATS market. There are also a few things that we knew we needed to work on. The directed order program, which you'll remember was put on hold last summer on feedback from our clients. We still believe that there's room for a mechanism that allows for competition and price improvement for valuable customer orders while providing price and size discovery to the market. And we'll continue to look at ways to find just the right program. And as hard as we tried for a simple, flat pricing model, we couldn't deny that that model didn't yield much in the way of market share. So last year seemed like the right time to introduce for the first time on any BATS market tiers. So how do we build on that? Creating additional competition for orders. Attribution. The concept of quote attribution isn't new to the cash markets. So when we announced its availability last month on our equities exchanges, we thought hard about how we could create an opportunity for competition for customer capacity orders through the use of member attribution and options. If a BATS options member wants to have their order out loud on the BATS feed, they'll be able to opt in having their quotes attributed to their executing firm ID on an order-by-order -order basis, creating additional competition for that order. And this functionality, functionality will be available on all of our markets on May 7th. Building on the success of NBBO Shedder, this past August, we moved some of the economics behind that program to help grow another market improving, improving initiative, which I mentioned earlier, called, called QIP, Quoting Incentive. Again, this, this program was designed to encourage members to consistently make aggressive markets across a broad range of series. To aid in the quoting process, we rolled out a bulk quoting interface that allows for members to manage multiple orders with a single message. And, and for folks that meet the quoting thresholds in more than 25 underlyings, these bulk order entry port fees are waived. This is all complemented by a full suite of risk management tools, free of charge, designed to help members to optimize trading while efficiently and effectively managing their risk. It's important to note that these programs and tools are available not just to market makers, but to all members regardless of capacity. So what's next? <clears throat> we understand that price competition will continue for the valuable customer order flow, and we'll continue to look to build out the breadth and depth of our market through NBBO Center and QIP programs. So in April, we introduced incentives for trading non-penny pilot securities. 
where a customer capacity order can see rebates as high as 76 cents a contract and as much as an 85 cent rebate for professional customer firm or market maker orders. As a result, batch options volume and non-penny pilot names more than doubled in April. And last month, we also introduced new customer pricing where BATS option members who have contract volume add and remove combine, regardless of, of capacity equal to 1% total consolidated volume, can achieve customer rebates as high as 45 cents a contract, along with take rates that scale as low as 36 cents a contract. Combined with BATS Grow With Us incentives, where members can receive improved economics between the standard TCV tiers, with as little as five basis points of TCV improvement over their, their previous high water mark, it's easier for, for folks to get better economics and, 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 and move, move in that direction. Again, BATS TCV requirements include both add and remove volume, not a fixed volume number. So with low industry volumes, better economics are more easily achievable on our exchange. So in closing, look for us to continue to drive efficiencies and, create incentive, and create incentives that benefit the markets and all BATS members. And with that, I'd like to introduce Patty Schuler from the BATS op uh, uh, Box Options Exchange. Thank you, Joe. Glad I'm not over at BATS. But anyways, um, I'd like to review some of our recent announcements in technology upgrades as well as new enhancements that are forthcoming over the next weeks and months. We released our new solicitation and facilitation auction mechanism for block trade executions this past October. We implemented the professional customer account order type in October, which allows participants to identify professional customer orders. We announced in October the release of new features to enhance our market maker's flexibility in establishing risk control parameters to better manage their quotations and related risk. At the end of October, we announced the release of a new voluntary functionality that allows participants to prevent their market maker or proprietary broker-dealer orders entered on box from trading with quotes or orders that were resting on the box book and originated from the same box participant. We have set up a new testing environment out of Equinix NY4 data center. We are working on ramping up our network infrastructure to reduce overall latency and to handle complex orders. In February, the SEC approved a reduction to the order handling and exposure period for the price improvement period from one second to 100 milliseconds. In March, we released a new feature allowing cross orders between two non-professional customers. We've also made some fee changes this past year. We've increased the credits and the debits inside the PIP mechanism, which the SEC approved on a 13-month pilot basis. We also implemented a new routing fee structure in March. For a complete overview of our fees, please refer to our fee schedule on our website. Uh, we created the Inbox, a monthly newsletter for our participants to keep up with what's going on at the exchange. We'd be happy to add you to the distribution list and it's also available on our website. A few relevant stats. In the month of April, price improved contracts on box averaged 271,000 per day. Price improvement versus the prevailing MBBO for contracts submitted via box's PIP auction averaged $173,000 per day. Total savings to investors this month, month were $3.4 million. With this, Box has saved investors over $384 million since its inception in 2004. Overall, average daily trading volume on Box in the month of April was 618,000 contracts, which represented a 39% increase over the same period last year. Some of the things that we are currently working on or are pending SEC approval, um, we are working on the development of a complex order book, which will launch in Q4, subject to SEC approval. All participants will be required to update to the latest versions of the various box services they are using. A preliminary draft set of rules for the complex order book will be submitted to the SEC in the coming months. We have announced a scheduled timeline of dates for certification of complex orders prior to launch. 
We are working on a website redesign as well as a fee schedule redesign, so hopefully a little bit easier on the eyes. Regarding the SRO, <clears throat> hopefully most of you saw the press release this past week that Box received approval from the SEC to act as its own SRO. This process was a long time coming, and we are very pleased and excited with the outcome. I just want to say that it would not have been possible if it were not for a very dedicated and hardworking legal team. So I'm sorry, my voice is like going crazy here, but uh, comprising of Lisa Fall, Ken Meaden, and Michael Burbach, as well as others. Thank you guys very much. With that, I would like to introduce David Gray, Vice President of Business Development at CBOE and C2 Exchanges. Thank you, Patty. Certainly on behalf of CBOE, I'm pleased to join all of you today in the Big Easy. Um, survived my first night in, in New Orleans, so I'm thrilled to death to be up here. Um, <laughs> I've been advised that the most valuable talent for a presenter is never to use two words uh, when one will do. So I will not take the full 12 minutes uh, allotted to me today and uh, just cover a few initiatives at CBOE. First of all, product development. We'll talk about over-the-counter opportunities and also new te technology enhancements. On the product development side, I'll begin with new product development, which has been a signature at CBOE since we opened nearly 40 years ago. Today I'll cover recent progress in just a couple of our newer index products, including SPX PM. Nurturing the early growth in X SPX PM, our newly launched electronic uh, S&P 500 options contract, has been a primary focus for us at CBOE in 2012. With experience as our guide, we aim to establish traction and steady growth by working closely with early adapters of SPX PM. We also expanded a comprehensive marketing and educational program intended to increase awareness and understanding of the product to a broader audience and, and also potential users. As a result of these efforts, SPX PM continues to gain traction despite periods of, as Peter noted, depressed industry-wide trading uh, since its debut in early October. We're encouraged both by customer feedback and trading activity. Monthly trading volume in the first quarter saw steady sequen uh, sequential gains and average daily volume increased nearly 16% over the previous quarter. It's also gratifying to note that open interest in SPX PM continues to build, topping uh, 100, 000, the 100,000 contract mark in both March and April. Worth mentioning is that open interest of 100,000 contracts in SPX PM is the notional equivalent uh, of, open inch, or of 1 million contracts in, in the uh, SPY options. Moving to our volatility area, this year we've continued adding to CBOE's and CFE's suite of volatility products as well as to our volatility, volatility related benchmarks, which now number two dozen. In March, we began publishing values for, for the CBOE VIX or VIX index or VVIX, which is, as, it names, as its name implies, tracks the volatility of the VIX. the VIX. The VIX of VIX index was developed for volatility traders looking for ways to formulate strategies based on the relationship between market volatility uh, as measured by the VIX index and the volatility of the index itself. This speaks to to the significance of the VIX index as a market indicator and shows just how far the VIX index has come. We often, we often see customer demand for tradable products tied to volatility benchmarks that prove to be of particular benefit in measuring, this pr proves to us to be a particular benefit in measuring and creating trading strategies. Such was the case with CBOE's ETF volatility indexes. Last year, we rolled out six benchmarks designed to monitor volatility in highly active sector-specific ETFs. This year, based on customer demand, we introduced options and security futures on three of these. The CBOE Emerging Markets ETF Volatility Index, the CBOE Brazil ETF Volatility Index, and the CBOE Crude Oil ETF volatil Volatility Index. And we look forward to further expanding our VIX product line in the months and years ahead. We continue to be encouraged as VIX options and futures show tremendous growth in this low-volume, low-volatility uh, trading environment, 
In the first quarter alone, VIX options average daily, uh, VIX options average daily volume rose 36 percent over the previous quarter and 4 percent uh, over the first quarter of 2011. While trading in VIX futures continue to ride a dramatic wave with record-breaking growth, we continue to expand our volatility marketplace by increasing awareness of CBOE as the world's go-to resource for volatility education and by expanding our roster of tools to help investors understand, calculate, and trade volatility. Over-the-counter opportunities. Let me now move to our initiative to expand our customer base, the OTC opportunity as we call it. It is significant for CBOE Holdings given that we offer many proprietary products that are well suited to this marketplace. We see current OTC market participants increasingly turning to exchange-traded alternatives, both in response to a post-crisis focus on systematic risk management and anticipated changes in, the OTC, in OTC trading likely as a result of the implementation of Dodd-Frank. Flex trading in CBOE's proprietary index products, for instance, grew more than 21% in 2011 and increased 24% in the first quarter of 2012. This increase is driven in part by dealer banks facilitating customer orders, as well as insurance companies and creators of structured products that have begun using flex, flex options in lieu of OTC trading. With this growth in mind, and with the potential for greater growth on the horizon, we developed customized trading technology called CFlex 2.0 to better serve this marketplace. CFlex 2.0 will enable customers to conveniently access flex options with the same CBOE interface that they use for standard options trading. Built entirely in-house, the new CFlex technology will feature a CBOE's automated improvement mechanism, which is our AIM functionality, which we expect to be enthusiastically embraced by flex and OTC users. We began a gradual rollout of CFlex last week, and we expect to be fully functional uh, by the end of the quarter. And in fact, with questions on this, Matt McFarland is here. would love to have you stop by the booth and, and have a chat with him. CFlex 2.0 is a major systems enhancement for us at CBOE. We expect it will attract additional trading to the CBOE marketplace, but it's also the center centerpiece of our technology initiative. And on with the new technology enhancements at the exchange. At our earnings call on Tuesday, we announced uh, that CFlex 2.0 marks the beginning of the rollout of our company's new trade engine technology called CBOE Command, which will culminate in the anticipated fourth quarter move of our CBOE and CFE servers from Chicago to New Jersey, where C2 and CBU, uh, CBSX data centers are currently located. We'll be talking about CBOE Command frequently in the months ahead, but let me provide some context context on what it means for our company and our customers. As a longtime CBOE employee, I know just how deeply embedded systems development is in our value proposition. While every exchange aims to provide faster, more efficient trading technology, CBOE systems are also uniquely developed to power innovation. We design our systems in-house and engineer them in-house for maximum flexibility and scalability enabling us to cost-effectively launch new products and, when appropriate, new exchanges to trade these products. Advanced trading technology has, for example, enabled us to successfully launch and trade our premium product lines, S&P 500 options, and, of course, VIX options and futures. Admittedly, this is a brief touch on CBOE Command, or, on our CBOE Command initiative, but you'll be hearing more about it again in the coming weeks and months. On a final note, before I can conclude, Conclude, in January, we implemented our new VIP program, our Volume Incentive Program, which pays credits to permit holders for executing certain types and levels of orders in business at CBOE. We've seen considerable market share gains in the first quarter as a result of VIP and have received a very favorable customer response. In fact, CBOE's first quarter market share in multi-listed products, excluding dividend trades, increased by 3.9% to 23%. Uh, for March compared to 19.1% uh, in December. That's a nice jump for us. In conclusion, to wrap up, we're energized about the future as we continue to expand and promote usage of our products and benchmarks, and as we prepare for changes in the OTC marketplace, and as we continue to power technology innovation with CBOE Command. We look forward to serving the growing needs of our customers with valuable products, technologies, and price structures that will benefit their trading experience. Thank you very much. 
It's now my pleasure to introduce Geraldine Endo from ISC, director. Thank you. It's Geraldine, no D in that, just for the record. <laughs> ISC has had an extremely busy and exciting year. We completed the implementation of our new trading platform called Optimize. We've implemented new functionality, products, market data offerings, and along the way, we've had a fee change or two. I'm only going to highlight a few areas, though, first of which is new functionality. We're thrilled to announce that we launched implied orders today, May 3rd. Implied orders dramatically increased the fill rate for spreads and tightened the ISC BBO by displaying liquidity from the complex book on the regular book published to Opera. How? If the limit price of a spread can improve the BBO, implied orders are created. This means each leg of the spread is paired against a resting order so that the net price of the complex order will be satisfied when both legs are filled against the regular book. For example, someone wants to buy the spy straddle for $1.99. The ICE BBO for both the call and the put is 98 by $1, so the synthetic offer is $2. Implied order functionality will create 99 cent bids for the call and put on the regular book. When an order arrives to hit the bid, the straddle will leg into the regular book. Implied orders complements our existing legging functionality launched in 2003. Optimize enabled ISE to be the first to bring implied orders to the U.S. options market. We continue to enhance Precise Trade, our proprietary front end application. Next week, we are introducing a suite of OMS features. Users will benefit from a more efficient workflow. Parent-child orders will allow users to enter large orders and break them into smaller orders for controlled execution. Order routing will enable users to have order flow fully captured in electronic format. Last year, we introduced additional risk management features. Risk administrators have direct access to manage the risk limits, such as maximum quantity, and a restricted list. For those who are interested, Precise is free for the first two months. In October, we launched the ISE Implied Volatility and Greeks feed. This is a real-time, low-latency Implied Volatility and Greeks data for full opera. Monday, we announced the launch of the ISE Premium Hosted Database, or PHD. PHD is an historical tick database that offers full opera, U.S. Equities Level 1, pre-computed implied volatility in Greeks, full corporate action history, and open-closed data. In April, we filed for SEC approval of a mini-options product. This will create a one-tenth size product for higher-priced stocks. We feel this will be well-received by the retail investor, as it makes trading high-priced products such as Apple and Google more affordable. Finally, our goal is to launch a second options exchange by year-end. Customers and mem members benefit from a second exchange with more market model choices. Both exchanges will run on Optimize. This will minimize the effort and cost for members to connect. So we've had an extremely productive year, and I've only highlighted a few of our accomplishments. We continue to provide new features while striving to bring value to our customers. In May, we again increased our industry-leading customer complex order rebate. We've also reduced the fee cap for firms and farms participating on crossing orders. I've covered a lot, so I'll finish by mentioning that ISE won Best Exchange Client Service at the Wall Street Letter 2012 Institutional Trading Awards. This is an important award to us, and over the next year, we will continue to strive to earn this recognition. Thank you. I'll now turn it over to Stacey Cunningham of NASDAQ. Hi, my name is Stacy Cunningham, and I run the uh, tra NASDAQ transaction sales team in the U.S. Once again, I'd like to welcome you all to the Crescent City. Hope you're enjoying this day so far, and if you need anything at all during the conference, please don't hesitate to find somebody from NASDAQ. Uh, you know, we're happy to assist. We're, we're here to help. At NASDAQ OMX, we've designed our options markets to complement each other. We believe that gives you the flexibility to choose how you prefer to conduct your business and it allows you to be most effective. 
our options markets have a single management team and a single support team. Single teams allow uh, you to get the most, uh, the, the fastest response when you're looking for an answer on something. When you need a quick response, having a single team and a single point of contact is, is uh, the quickest way to go. For us, it allows us to get feedback in a centralized location. We take everything we hear from our customers, whether it's ideas, frustrations, concerns, and we try to find ways to integrate that information into our platforms. So we turn that into new functionality. On the Philex side, uh, over the past year, we've introduced the ability for market makers to rest orders on the Philex book. Just this past week, uh, just this week, we've introduced um, routing for non-customer orders. These are all things that we've heard from customers that they were interested in seeing. We continue to build on our complex order auctions, as well as our pixel auction mechanisms, and provide new enhancements to those. In March, we introduced price protection parameters on complex auctions. They define a certain range in which a complex order is eligible to execute. It's just another layer of protection. We see new interest in both of those mechanisms on both the order entry side as well as the auction responder side and continue to develop those. So if you have feedback on, on what you'd like to see incorporated, please find someone, let us know. We'd, we'd, we're interested in hearing it. On the NOM side, the feedback that we heard over and over again was the need for bulk quoting, uh, robust risk protections, and the ease of development from our market-making community. So last year at OIC, we talked about our plans to tr transition to NOM 2.0 so that we could deliver on those requests. Uh, in Q3 2011, we completed that transition, and I'm happy to say that the NOM 2 project was a success. We now have common interfaces and common quoting requirements for both NOM and Philly. And those tech changes, uh, in, in conjunction with um, innovative pricing, has led to a lot of growth on NOM. We've doubled our number of registered market makers. We've grown our market share from 4.2% to uh, over 6%, with days as high as 7.5% market share. We're now looking to expand beyond NOM and Philly and introduce a third options venue using our BX Stock Exchange license. Still front of mind is ease of development and trying to make those uh, efforts on your part as minimal as possible. So we are going to use the um, identical interfaces to the NOM protocols to make it as simple, simple as, as we can. We do plan to introduce additional functionality, but I'll let Tom talk more about BX options over the next couple days. On the market data side, Philex and NOM each offer a prop feed with best quote information and last sale information. NOM also offers a full depth feed called ITO. We plan in July to introduce full depth for Philly as well. And again, sticking with that theme, it'll be just like ITO to keep it as simple as we can. If you, if you have any questions on our, our data products, please don't hesitate to ask. On the trade support side, we've consolidated help desks. So both our options markets and uh, both options markets and, and soon to be a third will be supported by common team. We think that that allows us to provide best in class service. All three options markets are in a single data center in Carteret, New Jersey. Uh, where we offer co-location, we offer extensive choice of network providers, uh, we also offer remote hand services. There are more U.S. exchanges in our Carteret uh, data center than anywhere else. Um, it's where all, of, all three of our NASDAQ equity exchanges are in the U.S. And on May 14th, we're moving the NASDAQ futures market from Philadelphia to Carteret as well. So NASDAQ futures brings me to the new products area. That, that's an area we've been very busy in uh, recently, and I'll just highlight a, a few of the different things. On May 1st, Philex became the only U.S. options exchange to list options on the MISCI Emerging Markets Index Funds. On June 1st, we plan to list the Philex Semiconductor, Housing, and Oil Sector Index Options on NAM. Currently, those trade exclusively on Philly. On June 25th, we'll transition our world currency options to Philex Forex Options. That uh, will involve symbol conversions and more user-friendly strike prices that will correspond to foreign exchange spot markets. NASDAQ OMX Futures, or NFX, introduce spot gold futures. It's retail-focused contracts that simulate over-the-counter uh, spot gold trading. We've had a lot of initial success, and we plan to explain, uh, expand that offering. Uh, we also, just today, during the exchange... Uh, updates. We had some breaking news, and, and F10 
has, let's see, they uh, announced our risk management offering. They, our risk management offering at F10 has announced uh, real-time analytics for options trading. So risk exposure, our, our, our RX product, now provides standardized real-time volatilities uh, data for brokers with options portfolios. So our co-location services, market data products, and attention to service, we believe they're all benchmarks in the options industry. And all of our offerings, in addition to those that we have planned, provide our diverse member base with the flexibility and opportunity to trade successfully with NASDAQ, even though their business models may vary greatly. NASDAQ OMX gives you options. I encourage you to talk to me or anyone here from NASDAQ. If you have any questions or any additional feedback for us, we're always interested in hearing it. Thank you for, my t for your time, and it's now my pleasure to introduce a founding member of the Out of Options Motorcycle Club, Bill Ryan, not NYC Amex Options. Well, Stacy, I'm sure Barry put you up to that, but that's okay. Um, we had a great year at Amex last year as, volume is, as far as volume is concerned, so I'm going to give you a couple of highlights. Uh, to our total volume last year was 618.7 million contracts. That's up 29% from 2010. Our electronic volume was 462.3 million. That's up 34%. And our open outcry volume was 156.5 million. That's up 14% from 2010 and represents 25% of our total. So I'm happy to say that our floor is alive and well. Uh, recently, we instituted a reserve Amex trading permit to allow market-making for firms on the floor to address a short-term absence of an employee due to an illness or a vacation. Um, and this reserve ATP will allow a qualified market-maker authorized trader to act as a floor market-maker on a temporary basis. Uh, ATP holders can now designate an Amex market-maker for electronic complex orders so that the marketing charges associated with those complex orders are available to that market maker for future disbursement. In July, we adopted rules to permit flex options to trade on options that are listed on any U.S. options exchange. So now with one day's notice, you can trade a flex option on our floor on a product that is not listed on our floor. Uh, the first phase of our self-trade prevention was launched in February and includes orders to orders uh, sent by market makers under the same trading permit ID. And this applies to PNP orders and PNP plus orders. An example of how that works is if a market maker sends in a buy order and currently has a resting sell order on the book at the same price, uh, the, order, the older of the two orders will be canceled. Unless, of course, the order is an IOC order that was sent in, in which case it executes. If the order is canceled, then a cancel message is sent back that says self-trade prevention. We have a new product coming, hopefully at the end of this year. Doors will begin to trade, and doors consist of the dividends, out, the divs, owls, and risks. Divs represent the dividend value of the stock. Owls are options with limited stock, and risk is residual interest in stock. The three pieces can trade separately. They'll have different risk-reward parameters, and when combined on the same side, they should have the same risk-reward parameter as the underlying stock. From technology, with the implementation of our group ID release, we further reduced our average acknowledgement time for market maker quotes by 20% from 500 microseconds to 400 microseconds. Our capacity stands at 5 million quotes per second, 320,000 orders per second, and over 800 million orders per day. We have some new technology offerings from NYAC technology. The first is the filtered options feed, a highly flexible, fully managed market data feed that filters U.S. options data based on customer design parameters. We have options analytics. That's a real-time market data feed that includes implied volatilities in Greeks. Uh, it monitors the opera feed and U.S. Uh, level one stock feeds for, uh, feeds for stock and, and indices. Uh, time and quote for options is now available. It covers U.S. options exchanges, quotes, time and sales, and stock data dating back to uh, 2004. And lastly, in the uh, technology side, we now offer a turnkey cloud computing package, and this is designed to enable participants uh, with cutting-edge access to U.S. options markets and services. So if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, please stop by and see us. We're at booth 213, and we have a bunch of us wandering around the rest of the weekend, so please stop by, say hello, and, and tell us how you feel. Uh, next up is Todd Wildman from NYSC ARCA. Thank you so much, Bill. Bill Ryan, to know him is to love him. If you don't know him already, I'd keep it that way. Okay, good. Everybody is listening. It's uh, great to be with you today in the Crescent City. 
Uh, NYSC ARCA has uh, had a wonderful last year, and uh, we're looking forward to a successful 2012. I'll start off being, uh, we still have an exchange floor in San Francisco. We still have real live traders on the floor of our exchange, and it is a green exchange. So we are uh, one of the first exchanges in the world to be certified green, uh, which is uh, pretty uh, important. If you live in San Francisco, you can tell people that I work at a green business. So uh, we're real happy about that. We're real happy with our participants and uh, how they've made NYSC ARCA options a great place to come and trade option orders. Uh, as uh, reported by S3 and Opera, uh, NYSC ARCA options in the penny pilot names, we were on the national best bid or offer uh, on the bid or offer uh, the, major the most majority of the time of any exchange out there of all nine. Uh, when we go up to 12 exchanges, I expect us to stay number one exchange, being on the NBBO, bid and offer, national best bid and offer, and penny pilot name. So I, I, could, I expect that to continue. Uh, as Bill Ryan talked about some of the things, I'll talk about some things that could be for both exchanges. Uh, realize that a lot of this is pending SEC approval, so if I forget to say pending SEC approval, just know that I meant it. Uh, the first thing I'd like to talk about are the minis are coming. The minis are coming. So uh, we filed with the SEC, and this is pending SEC approval, uh, listing uh, many options on high price stocks. Uh, so we're looking at stocks that are going to be over $100, uh, trading over 45,000 option contracts a day. Uh, how we're looking at it is uh, the premium is going to be the same amount. You see a premium in dollars and cents, and that's going to be multiplied by 100. Uh, we're going to take the strike, and basically uh, to pick the strike, we'll use Apple. If Apple's uh, 600 strike, you would drop a zero, and it's going to be the 7 AAPL 60 strike, and that would be, you would be executing, if you multiply it by 100, that's going to be $6,000 because you're going to be buying 10 shares of Apple stock for $600. So you're, it's for 10, 10 shares of stock overlay on high price stocks. So we're excited about that. Uh, also, our complex order book is expanding. Uh, we're going to have an equity leg available. Uh, it's going to be five legs. This is going to be both on ARCA and uh, Amex options. Uh, we're really excited about that coming forward. Uh, another thing is we're, uh, you know, at NYSC ARCA options, we like to give people choice and control on how they uh, handle their orders. Uh, we're coming out with our client management tool for options. This is going to be both on ARCA and Amex, both. But this is going to be a web-based uh, tool for you to be able to manage and see your option orders that are in our marketplaces. Uh, it's going to be web-based. You're going to be able to see your fills, your cancels, be able to uh, sort and data query on your option orders that are out there. We are also enhancing our risk mitigation uh, for both exchanges. Uh, we're going to have three choices for you to use uh, for risk mitigation. Uh, realize that for market makers, they have to use at least one of our three risk mitigation programs. Uh, for uh, order flow providers, they do not but uh, they can. Uh, we're going to break them down into three ways. You can um, manage your risk by uh, transaction-based, counting how many transactions you do, volume-based, and uh, percentage of quote. So uh, giving you more choice and control of your option orders. And, in the, uh, and realize that uh, NYSC ARCA options, uh, we still have one of the simplest fee schedules out there. We uh, don't change it often. We just did uh, May 1st. Uh, to increase our competitive posting tiers and penny pilot names. Uh, if any questions, please ask any of us here at the conference. Uh, we're uh, really excited moving forward uh, on this year, and uh, we thank our participants for making uh, NYSC ARCA Options a great place to trade options. It's with great pleasure I want to call up to the floor Carolyn Mitchell, first vice president of business development and strategy at the OCC. Carolyn? Thank you, Todd. So it's great to be here in New Orleans. It's great that all of you have chosen to be in this room. It's actually quite surprising to see so many people here. Um, I'm going to give you a brief update on OCC. I'll start with a little background for those of you who don't know much about OCC, and then I'm just going to cover two topics today, um, volume, and then talk briefly about our move into clearing OTC trades. 
So OCC, as most of you probably know, we clear for all nine of the listed options markets in the United States. We also clear for five futures markets and two security lending markets. We're regulated by both the SEC and the CFTC, um, which is a very fun um, position to be in during this time of regulatory reform. As you might guess, um, our company is spending a lot of time and energy um, working on various projects associated with regulatory reform. Um, most of you also know we operate as a not-for-profit. Um, at the end of the year, we take um, profits and we give them back to our clearing members in the form of a refund. Um, it's great to say that at the end of last year, we returned another $80 million back to our clearing members, which brings our average clearing fee down to about 1.5 cents a contract. We believe this makes us the lowest um, clear, it's the lowest clearing fee in the world. And I, I say that every year, and I'm waiting for somebody to correct me. Nobody has yet, so I'm still going to continue believing that. Um, talk a little bit about volume. Peter touched on global volume. I'm going to bring it down to just the volume in the United States on the listed markets. So 2011 um, was a trying year for many of us in many ways, but in terms of creating volatile markets, um, there were many opportunities in the options market. And I hate to sound like a broken record year after year up here, but we had another milestone year, um, and we set another high-volume record. Um, average daily volume exceeded 18.1 million contracts, and we cleared over 4.6 billion contracts. That's a 17% increase over 2010, and as you might remember, 2010 was another record year. Now, so far, year-to-date, in 2012, um, we're down about 7% as an industry, but we still expect this to be our second best year ever. Our securities lending business, on the other hand, is having a phenomenal year. Um, activity in security lending is up about 11%. So OCC manages these increased volumes really with relative ease. We spend a lot of time planning and testing um, double the highest level volume day so that when we have these peak volume periods, there's no interruption to business. It's something that we expect and we plan for year in and year out. I'm going to spend my remaining moments talking a little bit about OTC. Um, OTC markets are very different from the retail markets. Um, we saw with Peter's slide that they're maybe coming a little closer together. But generally, the listed markets have very high volumes, thousands of counterparties, um, and both retail and institutional participants. On the OTC side, we see much lower volumes but much higher notional um, amounts and a small number of institutional participants. So OCC's interest in clearing OTC contracts were only focused on the equity derivative segment. And the reason for that is we believe there, well, there's two main reasons. One is there's a, a benefit to our clearing members by being able to portfolio margin listed and OTC positions in the same account by margining those transactions together, offsets are recognized, and it lowers the overall cost of clearing. Another reason is we believe the benefits of risk reduction that clearing provides will help both markets grow. Um, much of the OTC market does their hedging in the listed markets, so there's a benefit to both markets, we believe, by offering clearing. Now, our initial clearing launch is starting with just one, one product, a, beta test, so to speak, um, offering clearing on options on the S&P 500 index. And we have, we're really, we're working with a fantastic group of members, and we've been working with them over the last two and a half years to get to where we are at this point. We've completed all of our development. We've completed testing between the members and MarketServe, who will act as the affirmation confirmation provider. Um, and to OCC, end-to-end -end testing. And at this point, we're just working very closely with the SEC, with FINRA, and with SIPA to, to get regulatory approval. We are optimistic that we're going to have regulatory approval by third quarter, and at that time, we'll launch this new service. Um, this system we build is scalable, so it's designed to support the next group of products that we will be rolling out. Um, certainly additional index options, perhaps share options, and we're also looking at equity swaps. But I'll give you more on that at next year's update. 
Um, given the time, I'm now going to introduce my good friend and colleague, Dan Busby, who is Vice President of Member Services at OCC. Thank you. Carolyn, um, I think you forgot to mention that OCC has a green logo. <laughs> Again, uh, Dan Busby, I'm Vice President of Member Services. I'm here to give an update on the OCC Roundtable. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Roundtable is comprised of senior representatives from the, all the options exchanges, uh, OCC staff, and also uh, 19 clearing members. These 19 clearing members represent 88% of options volumes, so we feel that we have a good representation from the firms, they represent a cross-section of um, business types from the full-service broker-dealer to regional firms, uh, largest firms such as Merrill Goldman, small firms like Southwest Securities, online firms like Scott Trade. Um, one of the things that uh, is interesting, I mean, I'm standing here in operations listening to all the business development people talking about all the great products that are coming down the pipe, and from an operations perspective, um, they get a little nervous about everything that's talked about because they have to figure out how to implement it, how to get it into the system, how to get it onto the statements. Um, so it's, it's just a, a good group of people. We look at uh, the impacts of new exchanges, new products, um, especially the minis that are coming down, uh, dailies that are, are people are talking about. So in, in, in that respect, it's very important that everyone understands how important the operational aspects to all of these things that we're talking about. Um, the, the roundtable meets on a quarterly basis, but we have conference calls all year, depending on what the issues are. We have one coming up talking about the symbology um, issue with uh, a product like the minis and how we should handle it as an industry. Um, the two things that I'm going to talk about are large projects that the roundtable has spearheaded um, and they've been talking about for a, a couple of years now. The first one is getting rid of Saturday night or Saturday expiration. So right now f from an operations standpoint, once a month options expire. Everybody knows that on Saturday, but firms have, they have staff come in every Saturday to do this, um, to do their processing, their balancing. Over the past five to ten years, OCC and the Roundtable have identified multiple steps along the way to streamline the clearing process. So by doing that, we've come to the conclusion that we just need to get rid of it and make uh, the standard expiration as normal as a weekly expiration, as a quarterly expiration. How we've been able to do that is that, like everybody knows, all trades come in real time to OCC. Trades and post-trade transaction volume goes right back to the firms in real time for those firms that are able to handle it. 95% of post-trade transactions are automated. Um, the auto X threshold went from 75 cents to a penny. So a lot of these things that are building upon the path to get rid of this, um, this Saturday environment. OCC is including customer ID on post-trades, on CMTA trades at the exchange as well. And then... There's another aspect to it in terms of the processing windows that OCC handles on a nightly basis. So a window essentially lets you know that no more transactions can enter the system. We're going to run our processing so that the firms can get their data back, then the customers can get their information, their exercise assignments, et cetera. We've moved our trade, uh, all trades in from the exchanges, went from 7 p.m. to 5 p.m., all CMTA post-trades have gone from 7 p.m. to 5 p.m. We close our window now at, at night at 6 p.m. So on a normal day, we're seeing our firms getting all of their, their data service and what they need to build those statements by 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. The ultimate, um, the ultimate success of that type of streamlining has Came, has come to the conclusion, let's just go to Friday night expiration. And the key, one of the key things that I do want to mention about Friday night is that the big benefit that we see from OCC is put, this will force all of our firms to a real-time processing environment. So looking at it from a risk perspective, 
they will, all firms will now know where they stand, what trades they have. And it's interesting because we are seeing some of that balancing happening the next day as opposed to on, on T. Um, that the firms that are real-time now, who really don't have an issue with going to an expiration Friday, they tend to call us or they know before the exchange has an issue with trades or if there's an issue at the clearinghouse even before we do because they're getting this data immediately and they see a stop in, um, in the trades coming from one exchange and then eventually it, it does turn out that there's an issue. Uh, in terms of other benefits, I mean, the, the real-time benefit is, is one of the, the real-time processing benefit is the key thing that we see. There's staffing costs, there's IT costs that um, will not need to, to be handled. Um, it'll be a repeatable uh, type of process so that there's not this Saturday that, you know, some staff come in once every six months and then they're not understanding how the whole process works. So we're... Um, excited about this. Um, Jerry Love gave a um, presentation today at the CIFMA, uh, the CIFMA committee. Um, Dave Harrison is out in Phoenix doing the same thing for, um, at the CIFMA operations conference and we'll be talking about it. We have conference calls with all the members. We're not seeing any issues at this point. We don't foresee anything from a, a retail or customer side perspective. It's all at the plumbing, back office, operations uh, portion of it. You'll be seeing in the next couple of weeks of more definitive time frames. We're looking at the next 12 to 18 months. There's legal work to do, but we're not seeing anything um, where we wouldn't be able to handle this and get it done. Um, the next initiative is the creation of an options give up allocation facility. Currently, um, we have CMTA trades, we have CMTA post trades. The CMTA post trades have proliferated to a point where the, the original uh, idea for them is, is not working for firms and for our um, surveillance um, uh, regulatory agencies. So the, we're in the process right now of working with the roundtable, OCC staff coming up with um, requirements to create this facility that will give the power to trades coming, CMTA trades and post trades to the give up firm. A firm can, like they do today, have an agreement, one firm here, one firm here, I, I want everything to come in, P trades and post trades. Well, sorry. <laughs> um, trades and post trades will come in and go right to the, uh, to the give up firm. The thing that is different is we, were go we are going to allow the give up firm to say, hey, wait a minute, I want to affirm these CMTA trades and post trades coming in before they hit my account at OCC. Similar to the futures allocation model in most other clearinghouses in the world. Um, so it's giving that choice to the, um, to the firms that we believe is important in this environment as firms clear and then post trade out those, um, those transactions. Again, another thing that we believe will um, help in terms of identifying the trade to post trades is mandating customer ID on post trade transactions. Right now that's an, a, an optional field. For some firms use it, some firms don't, but OCC will be mandating it on the CMTA post trade. The other issue that has come up recently, like Carolyn talked about, with the um, with all the regulatory uh, in, in this regulatory environment, is the inability for the regulators to tie a trade, a, a CMTA post trade, to the original trade. So what the exchanges are working on now, and we will will be implemented as part of this plan is to have a trade identifier on the trade coming into OCC and then the trade you need to use that trade identify trade identifier to post trade out transactions you could do it on multiple trades multiple trade IDs out to multiple give up firms you'll also OCC will also generate an average price to assist in that um, in that environment we also are looking at moving clearing fees on the, um, on the post trades, but uh, that's still uh, to be determined. So those are the two main items going on at the roundtable, uh, among others from corporate actions. Anything that comes up in the industry, it's a good group, and they're handling it, um, the concerns of the customers and, and making sure that they come up with the right uh, solution, system enhancements to, um, to make us all successful as an industry. 
It is now my pleasure to introduce Alan Grigoletto, um, director at OIC. Thank you, Dan. Um, as a representative of OIC, I also want to make sure that I welcome the sponsors. It's, uh, as you know, all of this curriculum and all the entertainment is, is not possible without the support of the sponsors. And I think we have a terrific agenda uh, at the OIC conference. The entertainment is stellar. You're going to have a great time. Um, also, I'd like to welcome my fellow colleagues in the industry as well as the rest of the attendees. Um, a few of the, my, the prior speakers spoke about the declining option volume and mentioned that the option volume was down 7.7% uh, this year. I'm here to tell you what OIC is doing to reach out to new users of options and hopefully grow the market. So we've been very resolute in our mission to hope, help grow the U.S. options market, and we provide education on both the risks and benefits of listed options. We're expanding our reach to financial advisors, and I don't know how many of you are aware, but we're also running a concurrent uh, curriculum for wealth advisors right here in the hotel. It's for 50 of the top wealth advisors in the nation. Ten of them made the Barron's Roundtable uh, with assets under management uh, averaging roughly about $200 million, all the way upwards to $2 billion under management. What do they have in common? They all want to learn about options. This is a new space. It's a new uh, uh, opening uh, entree into the business. And well, I have to thank, personally, Barry Nobel, whose dream it was to put on a Wealth Advisor Summit and draw people in to really trying to learn about options and how they can put them to use within their practice. We've also gotten um, some key breakthroughs this year by, by being invited to branch office educational lunch and learns. And we've done these for Morgan Keegan, Morgan Stanley, Securities America, and FPA. And we encourage other firms to participate in this as well. Um, we continue to fund online CE, uh, we're funding online CE approved education through a partnership with Rutgers University. And we're in discussions to do the same with the University of Chicago. The inaugural Wealth Advisors uh, Summit, as I said, is a realization of OIC's mandate and express and in the express vision of Barry Novell. Um, they have two days of agenda, and they're going to be able to get seven CE credits while they're here learning about not just options, but all of the pertinent things that are important to their practice, fixed income, real estate, trusts, all of these topics that are, that are key to their practice. And we're injecting some, some very specific options discussions uh, within those panels. We're also reaching out to new partners to help drive new business. Um, what's, what's unique, too, is that we now have sponsors in the Wealth Advisors Summit that, for the first time, are coming to us, the OIC. And those include such firms as BlackRock, Van Eck, TJM, Invesco PowerShares, and Barclays. Um, this year, we've signed a couple of content sharing agreements. What that is is any, anyone can sign a content sharing agreement with OIC, provided it agrees to the mandates. And what it is is they can uh, download uh, any kind of the educational materials that we have on our website. And uh, this year, Wells Fargo and CRT LLC both signed content sharing agreements just recently. We're appealing to a broader group of institutional investors through a collar study of diverse underlying assets. That's going to be released in a press conference later today. There's 15 underlying assets, and uh, I'll save uh, uh, the real poignant points to, for that discussion later, and, and I won't steal their thunder. Um, we're also, besides the wealth advisors, we have an initiative to reach out to pension funds. And this shows enormous potential. In fact, uh, a few of the risk managers that are over in the Wealth Advisor Summit are former market makers from uh, the floor exchanges that are now the risk managers for pension funds. In the past, a pension fund wouldn't touch an option with a gun to their head. But they're starting to give off small portions of their portfolio to manage with risk managers who are doing overlay strategies, protective put strategies, and this has enormous potential for our industry. Um, we are also um, continuing to, to, to press our education through um, social media. 
We have a stock Twits platform, and all of our social, uh, social, social media efforts are allowing us to direct, directly engage with investors and educate them about the benefits and risks of, of options. We're also increasing our visibility of U.S. listed options beyond our own borders. We've conducted educational seminars recently in London, Italy, and Australia. We have new content sharing partners. Uh, UK Chartered Institute of Securities and Investments has an interest in collaboration, as well as the Associated of Futures Markets based in Budapest, Hungary. And we have a pending agreement with Turkdex in Istanbul. Um, for the, second, for the second time, we sent a delegation to China to el educate their regulators and government officials about the U.S. options market. And just recently, we hosted several delegates from the China, uh, China Futures uh, Exchange staff, and they, and they have invited us, in turn, to speaking roles in their country. We recently re redesigned our website. Please check out optionseducation.org. We've improved the navigation. We have new content. We have interactive features. OIC is in compliance for all the materials that are out there. This is, this is huge, folks. If you have issues with compliance in your own broker-dealers, your own firms, we've already, we've already gone through the compliance approvals for all of the materials, and it's yours to use for free. So why reinvent the wheel? Come to us. We have it. Um, we're not neglecting retail. I've talked about wealth advisors. I've talked about pension funds. Retail, of course, is our core business. We have a new evening seminar on advanced strategies. For the first time, due to popular demand, we have three- and four-legged strategies um, that, we've, that we've given several of these uh, presentations already in Philadelphia, New York, and Chicago, and they've been widely received. The level of expertise of the retail investor has grown phenomenally over the, ten, over the last 10 years. It's not just attributable to OIC, but it's also attributable to you, the broker-dealers, the discount brokers, the exchanges who, who educate your customers. We piloted dual track recently, a dual track investor education day to accommodate both novices and more experienced uh, option users. This went very, very well, rather than just giving one planned session and then hoping that the newbies grasp on to some of the more difficult concepts, we break it into two, two tracks, and that's worked very well. Um, to, in conclusion, I'd like to say that OIC receives countless requests for options education from Canada, Latin America, Europe, South America, Australia, and Asia. We are seeing growing interest in our product from retail investors, universities, even the jewelry trade, endowments, pension funds, charitable trusts, and we think the growth opportunities for our business are absolutely enormous. So OIC is your industry resource. We want you to take advantage of our free educational programs and services to help you build your business. And now I'd like to introduce my friend, Jim Boyle of UBS. Thank you. Well, welcome, uh, friends, associates, and in my case, uh, relatives. It's good to see you here. It's uh, really nice to see everybody. The, uh, I'm the chairman of the Listed Options Trading Committee. I would like to give you a little update on uh, where we are, what's, uh, what's been going on in the last year, and where we think uh, we're going next year. The um, SIFMA's job is to promote responsible regulatory reform. And uh, we have plenty of that, so uh, we have a lot of work to do ahead of us. The, uh, one of the focuses is not to look at just the deadlines, but also to make sure that we're getting things done correctly. The, uh, we attempt to build consensus with, uh, in many complex issues, try to get all the issues on the table so that people can make informed decisions on what the right direction for a various um, project is. The, we, we also bring together shared interests of banks, firms, exchanges, we, and equally important, we push out a lot of information. We try to gather as much information, get it out to the committee members, and that can get dispersed in the interest of promoting transparency in our business. It seems to be working pretty well. The, uh, since Savannah, we've been working on um, various issues, some of the higher levels like uh, the HFT white paper that SIFMA put out, the uh, Volcker rule, 
the myriad of filing, uh, fee filings. Some of them kind of controversial, pretty much most of them just trying to, the exchanges trying to compete with each other. Uh, the real, f a lot of focus that we look at is on market structure issues. So when, when any of the rule filings have to do with uh, what we consider, or any of us consider market structure issues, we make sure we bring those up. And then the, late, the latest one is um, the myriad of new exchanges. I don't know if uh, you saw that uh, a couple days ago, MyEx finally filed their Form 1. They're looking at a September launch for the Miami Exchange. Uh, see how that goes. The uh, few of the things that we're working on now are uh, the ORF, I, a lot of the things that you've heard about are here, but also the ORF, the options regulatory fee. This is um, a way for the industry to fund its regulation. The goal of it is to be fair, transparent, and consistent. Uh, I'd like to actually thank um, Amex Arca as, as well as uh, Mike Babel for taking a leading role to facilitate this process. It's really helped push it along. Uh, the, um, the plan kind of looks like right now the direction it's going to have an NMS plan. All the exchanges are involved in. Uh, it, it, it's feeling like it's going the right directions. There's still some hurdles to, to, um, to jump, but uh, we're hoping uh, that we can have something for uh, Jan 1 of 2013. I know that's a high hope, but uh, we're going to certainly push for it. You've heard a lot of uh, people talking about the minis. The minis are coming over here. The, what we're focused on at, at SIFMA is uh, we always like to see new products, see new things coming out. But we, the, um, you heard um, Gerilyn and, um, and Todd talk about their two, that they're both looking at doing minis. Well, the, the problem is, is that they have two proposals. I, uh, SIFMA likes some of um, the proposals, uh, some of the issues or um, items in each one of the proposals. And today at the meeting, uh, SIFMA voted to actually echo the uh, TD Ameritrade comment letter and ask the exchanges to get together, uh, decide what pieces of the puzzle they can work on. A lot of the common issues like number of expiries that go out, uh, the threshold that they use to uh, determine whether or not a, um, a stock can trade um, in, uh, in uh, minis. And... Uh, and, and the opera price reporting process and how that will um, that that will affect um, the minis, especially in some of these stocks that have many uh, corporate actions. Uh, you heard a lot of talk. There's been more and more talk about the um, dailies. The uh, as you as uh, we heard OCC say, there's a the exchanges uh, the um, firms are getting much much better. The operations department trying to move away from the, uh, the, the Saturday expiration and, and get together so that they can literally, uh, you know, clear options every, every day. Right now we do it kind of, you know, every four days or every five days, and then we have some, uh, you know, quarterlies in there. So the, the, the uh, customers or the uh, firms are getting around to it. Some of the bigger firms are having a little bit harder tr tr uh, time with it. But I think we're going to get there, and um, I think you should. It, it feels like as soon as uh, the OCC, the firms, especially a lot of the big firms are ready, the, the OCC is pushing them that way. It looks like we should; those should be coming up uh, soon, or um, yeah, maybe even before we uh, visit uh, get together down in Vegas. Uh, another item brought up at the uh, SIFMA meeting today was the. Uh, prohibition or the um, information barriers necessary if you're a concurrent equity and option market maker. Uh, we think that that has some, um, in some cases, that it, that's appropriate, and maybe in other cases, these two businesses could actually be complementary and uh, operate as one. So uh, we're going to be taking a look at that and see if we can, um, see if we can do um, something with that. Uh, we've we've been kind of waiting and hoping that the uh, limit up, limit down proposal uh, gets uh, approved. Um, I, I think that they're working on some of the operational functioning issues. Um, they, we have until the end of May to figure that out. If, you know, 
I, we think that that's probably a better process than the, uh, than the current single stock. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm around all weekend. I uh, don't hesitate to stop by. I, um, and uh, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Jim Toes from SDA. Jim. <clears throat> Oh, thank you, Jim. Let's get this going. We'll get him down to the uh, end stretch. I think I'm the second to last one here. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Listen, so I'm, I'm Jim Toes, and I'm with the Security Trades Association, also known as the STA. Uh, the STA was formed in 1934. We are a national uh, trade organization comprised of individuals from uh, the buy side and sell side firms. We have uh, 23 affiliate organizations across North America. Uh, we're comprised of uh, volunteer boards. And many of these affiliates have 50 plus years of history in their communities and they're recognized for much of the uh, education that they do in their communities for market structure issues and also their, their various charitable organizations that they support. So they are, they are truly ingrained uh, in their local communities. The history of SDA kind of finds its roots in, in the cash markets. Uh, many of our members today, just with the evolution of the job market, we had, they have uh, uh, you know, uh, experience on the trading side, the compliance side, and the middle office side also. You know, but over time, as, as markets have evolved and, and technology has really created one virtual marketplace by linking three asset classes like cash, uh, cash futures, and, and options, um, our, our members have, have evolved, and, and as an organization, we, we have to have evolved also to help them out with their needs on this. Um, it's obviously, you know, it's a very difficult environment to be, to be expanding when resources are, t are, are tough, but, but we, are, we find ourselves uh, very fortunate because, uh, like I mentioned earlier, our organization is, is geographically diversified, and the demographics of each affiliate is, is different. As in the case of uh, equity options, we're fortunate enough to have an affiliate located in Chicago. It's had much 75-year history. Um, if we were talking about LATAM, we'd be talking about our Florida affiliate. And if we were talking about buy side issues, we'd be talking about Boston uh, and Denver. And if you want to talk about retail, we could talk about St. Louis, and that kind of goes on and on and on across all, tw all 23 affiliates. That's a core strength of, of STAs is to have these affiliates that have all niche uh, demographics involved in them. Uh, even though we have these affiliates with diverse skill sets, uh, at the national level, you know, we still need to find strategic partners to help us provide content to our members. Uh, these affiliate boards, like I mentioned, are volunteer organizations, so you can, we can only expect so much from them. And I think that as we, as we look back at, at, the, at the partners that we've picked in the past and, who, and also who, who have picked us, uh, it's, we have a pretty good history of being a, of being a good partner for people, and, and the relationships tend to be mutually beneficial for both organizations. Um, you know, we are, we're a good distribution platform, and uh, we mean that sincerely. It's, and it's not just a, uh, a distribution list of emails. It's, it's a true partnership that we find that what usually works for the people that we're partnering with usually works well for us also, and, and it's, it's good for all parties around. And I want to just give you three examples of, of what I'm talking about. I want to give you one from the past, one from the present, and one from the future. If we roll the clocks back to 1990s, when it was very evident down, down uh, that a lot of uh, regulatory action that was occurring down in Washington, D.C., was occurring on, on the legislature side. When, I, when we say legislation, we mean the politicians, the congressmen, and the senators. It became obvious to the organization that we had to have a presence down in, in D.C. in the late 90s. Uh, we went out as an organization. We found a firm called Williams & Jensen, which is the law firm that we use down there. We were, one of, we were one of their first Wall Street clients. That relationship is still intact today. It's going on, you know, close to 12 years. If you looked at Williams and Jensen's client list, it's, it's a very good list of, of Wall Street firms, and it's also worked out well for us as an as an organization. Ha having a, a strong partner in D.C. in Williams and Jensen has enabled us to leverage the diverse the geographical diversity of of our of our affiliates. Uh, right now, as we sit here in this room and we're looking forward to this whole thing coming and coming to an end and going outside and having a drink and, and having some food, there's around 60 congressmen on the House Financial Services Committee who are, who are involved in our marketplace, writing up legislation and writing up rules. Uh, the STA tent has an affiliate in more than half of their uh, districts. Uh, we are not huge on the PACT side, but we are huge on getting the politicians in front of their constituents 
And if there's one thing that they like more than uh, a check is, is to get votes. So we, we, are, we have been very effective with them on that side. Um, an example of a good partnership as far as in the present, you probably, we can just go back to last June when the SEC passed large trader reporting. Um, we, we saw firsthand uh, from the results of sponsored access that our members were going to need good information on this and that there were still a lot of issues that needed to be resolved on large trader reporting. Uh, we went out and we see, we, we've uh, formed a very good partnership with Financial Information Forum, FIF. Uh, they provided a tremendous amount of content, some very good working, uh, working people to work with. In return, we were able to uh, get them access to uh, SEC commissioners who were involved in the voting process for many of the exemption requests that they were looking for. And I think that that's a, a good example of a, a present-day partnership that got, that got off to a, a good start um, and had a very uh, successful uh, result at the end of it, and we're looking forward to doing more work with FIF going forward. Um, a future partnership, I think, is right here in this room with, with OIC. Um, I mean, I know the partnership is very early in the stages. We've only been kind of dealing with each other for around four months. Um, but we've, we've been fortunate to be able to show a couple of comment letters that we've written to make sure that, that anything that we're writing uh, on Limit Up, Limit Down, or Consolidated Order Trail, or Capital Formation, or, or the NYSE RLP program, that the, the letters are getting a look at by uh, the people on the, on, the option, on the equity option space. So, whoops, sorry about that. So, you know, we're, we're feeling good about that. And I think it's, there's starting to be some pretty good synergies between us. You know, as, as Alan was talking earlier, many initiatives are having with the pension funds. That that's where they're touching the portfolio managers, where we tend to touch the, uh, the trading desks themselves. So uh, it's great that they're teaching the PMs how to, how to use the stuff. At some point, someone on that desk is going to have to click a button to enter a trade, and, and I think that's where we could probably maybe add some value to the relationship. All right, so, yeah, I think you have a pretty good idea as far as, far as who we are, where we've been, and, and where we are. To, to get down to kind of what we're working on today, you know, uh, when people say, can you just give me the update, I, I, I break it down usually into two areas. One is the business side, so what are we doing as an organization to grow, and then what issues are we focused on? Uh, as far as growing the business, obviously, we, you know, we just talked a lot about what we're doing, uh, what we're doing in the equity option space that we're uh, looking to get more of a presence in there. Um, but on the client side, I think wh where we are going to have the best success this year is going to be with, with the buy side. Um, STA, as we, uh, STA has 60 uh, buy side traders who are serving on the uh, 23 affiliate uh, organizations that we have around the country. We have four on our national committee. Uh, we have a good history with, with the buy side traders. Um, now more than ever, the buy side is involved in market structure issues. I think it was only maybe three, four years ago where if a market structure issue were to come into the marketplace, the buy side just would let the, let the broker dealer handle it and would expect things to go on as, as there was before the rule was put in place. And that clearly has changed. So I think we, have, we are well positioned uh, with the buy side, uh, both from you know the, the, what we have already, uh, our history with them, and, and also that there's definitely the, a demand uh, for the services that, that we can get as far as getting them access down to D.C. on a very neutral basis. So we're very encouraged about that. Um, as far as the issues, I know Jim touched on a lot, a lot of the, the regulatory issues out there, so I won't, you know, I would just say us too. Um, but the one issue that we are that we are looking at now is is the capital formation and, and in particular the Jobs Act and I think that's something that I'm really surprised that it's not getting as much um, uh, press and as much uh, you know attention that, that it really deserves at this stage. I mean, you know, we're, we're you know we're in a really dire straits right now and and you know our country obviously needs four million jobs for us to get out of this quagmire. And I don't care you know what what industry you're in whether you're you know, making donuts or, or selling stocks. You know, we, we need people out there with, with jobs and with real jobs. And, and those 4 million jobs are only going to come from, from small, young companies. I mean, I think everyone realizes that, you know, GE is not going to go out and hire 4 million people tomorrow. And this is a, this is a very significant piece of uh, legislation that got passed. And it kind of gets us, I like to use the analogy, it kind of gets us to the seventh inning of, of this. And the next three innings is really kind of going to fall upon us as, as market structure people to figure out are there any market structure issues out there that are impeding or, or facilitating capital formation. And uh, it's something that I think we all need to do a little bit of a soul searching on to find out if things um, like tick size increments make sense for certain companies. 
So that, that's about it. So th those are the, uh, the issues that we're focused on. Um, I'm going to now, I, I think I've gone over my allotted time here. Um, I'm going to uh, thank you all, and I'm going to introduce the next speaker. The next speaker is Joe Corcoran. He is uh, Vice President and Head of Government Affairs for OCC. Where is Joe? Okay, Joe. Uh, please join me in welcoming Joe. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to uh, represent uh, the co uh, Securities Market Coalition in Washington, D.C. As you may know, I just started um, last month. Uh, brief background on me. Prior to coming to the OCC, I worked at NYSE Euronext, and um, I started my career at the SEC, where I worked for almost six years. And So enough about me and on to the Washington focus. Um, one of the primary focuses of the coalition's DC efforts at this point in time is on tax legislation. And so you watch the news right now, you're probably thinking, why is he talking about any sort of legis legislation at this point in time? It seems like Congress is not getting anything done. And the consensus is that you'd be right, um, at least at this point in time, until the uh, November elections. Um, after the elections, a number of people I've spoken to uh, believe that there could be a big rush to get legislation done by the end of the year, particularly tax legislation. Um, a number of significant tax laws are set to expire at the end of the year, including the Bush-era tax cuts. So what this means is if Congress does nothing from a legislative perspective uh, by the end of the year, then capital gains tax could raise from 15 to 20 percent and income taxes could go up for everyone. So I think the people I've spoken to believe that Congress, both parties, regardless of the outcome of the election, really have an incentive um, to do something on the, tax, on the tax front. And so the question is, how does this the, affect the options industry? Um, well, what all this leads to is the possibility that 60-40 tax treatment for market makers could come under consideration after the November elections. Um, as you may know, President Obama has included a repeal of the 60-40 tax treatment as part of his budget uh, each year since he's been elected, uh, including this past budget. Um, in addition, there's a bill pending in the Senate that was introduced by Senator Levin to eliminate 60-40 treatment, tax treatment for all market participants. So uh, with all this background in mind, obviously the coalition's going to keep a close eye on this issue and represents uh, the coalition's interest in it. Um, more recently, uh, the coalition submitted a comment letter on proposed IRS regulations. Um, it was submitted uh, at the beginning of April. Uh, the proposed regulations would impose U.S. withholding taxes on certain options transactions entered into by non-U.S. persons, such as offshore hedge funds. Um, if adopted as proposed, we believe the regulations could have a negative impact on the listed options markets by curtailing their use by foreign persons. Um, just to give you some perspective on the proposed regulations, OIC commissioned a study last year by the TAB group uh, that found that 10% of options, U.S. option volume originated in Europe. Um, and more specifically, uh, under the regulations, an adjustment to the, this is what the regulations would do, um, or at least theoretically what they would do. An adjustment to the strike price of an option covered by the regulations to reflect a special dividend would be treated as a deemed dividend subject to U.S. withholding tax, which is currently uh, 30%. Um, in addition, if an option is covered by the proposed regulation, and is entered into after a regular dividend has been declared, but before the ex-dividend date, it appears that the uh, proposed regulation would treat the option as giving rise to a deemed dividend subject to 30% withholding tax. Um, as we argued in our comment letter, the intent behind the proposed regulations was to capture transactions designed to evade withholding taxes uh, such as certain equity swap transactions, and accordingly are too broad in their current form in cap capturing listed options. Um, we obviously will keep the coalition apprised of any updates in connection with the issue. Uh, I spoke to the tax counsel who wrote the comment letter for the coalition. Uh, his name is Bill Paul. Uh, he works at Covington. 
um, and I think we're very fortunate to have him as our tax counsel. Uh, and I spoke to him earlier this week, and uh, just to get a sense of what he thought might happen with respect to these proposed regulations, and he thought, uh, given the number of comment letters that the IRS received, he thought they might or were taken aback at the uh, comments generated by the proposals. Um, the effective date right now, the proposals is, is uh, the beginning of next year, but he he thought that maybe given the volume of the comment letters that it may cause the IRS to rethink that effective date. And, you know, obviously it'll take them some time to digest all those comment letters. Uh, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention Dodd-Frank um, and the Dodd-Frank issue of interest or one of the issues of interest for the coalition is portfolio margining. And as you may be aware, the CFTC and SEC are required under Dodd-Frank to adopt rules to facilitate portfolio margining and securities and uh, futures accounts. Um, in other words, they're supposed to adopt rules to facilitate customer choice as far as where they hold their positions. Unfortunately, to date, uh, the agencies have not published any proposed rules on portfolio margining and there's no deadline for them to do so. Uh, obviously, the coalition will follow their activity closely and encourage them to act sooner rather than later. Um, that's it for the uh, DC update. The preceding program was a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes.